nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Uh, this, that's the outline of this series of lectures that I was giving. So we're now like on number five. So what I'll be talking about is spin. I mean, that's something we haven't really, hasn't really come up so far in our discussion. But this basic model that I've tried to set up in the last few lectures about this elastic resistor, the idea that as long as you yeah, think of it like electrons go through this channel elastically, and lose energy in the contacts. You can write the current in this form. And this conductance itself, we have obtained various expressions for that conductance that we, you know, help you relate to different things. And in this context today, what I'll do, it will be useful to just go back to that first form that I had written down. Namely, what's the conductance? Well, it's this density of states divided by the transfer time. See, and then we said, well, transfer time for diffusive transport was something, ballistic transport was something else. Now, in this context, actually, we'll go to what we discussed last day, which you might call interface-limited transport. So let's say you have a device in which, you know, getting through this part is relatively fast. The important thing is getting in and getting out. Now, in practice, of course, this is also important in a real device, but as you'll see, I'll explain why, that that part of it actually makes the device not work as well. Ideally, what you really want is for it to be interface limited. And this is the basic device that I'll start with, that's this spin valve, okay? And <clears throat> yeah, then we'll go on to things. So the spin valve then, if you're trying to understand it, or the first point is what I have mentioned before, that usually all energy levels, these energy channels inside your de device, they come in pairs. There's an upspin and a downspin. And they are usually exactly the same, which is why we often don't pay much attention to it. It's like, oh, you remember to multiply by two at some point. And the only confusion is when you multiply certain things by two and don't, etc. right? Otherwise, it's just a matter of putting in the two. Now, but what I'll be describing today though, there is a distinction between them. You actually, and I'll explain how you do that. And that's what I've tried to color code as red and blue. So when I draw this density of states, you know, this diagram I've always been drawing, energy density of states this way. Now on this side, I've drawn a blue thing here. There's a blue part, there's a red part. Meaning upspin, upspin's red, downspin's blue. And when I draw it this way, I don't mean the density of states is negative or anything. It's just for clarity, I've drawn it on the other side. That's all. You see, they're really on top of each other. You know, that axis is a density of states, and of course, it's not negative, it's positive. Okay. So that's this blue and red. And because it's usually degenerate, the, this channel, there is nothing special about it. In a spin valve, usually nothing special about the channel. It's just like any other semiconductor or metal, non-magnetic metal. Okay. And so red and blue are exactly the same. Now the distinction comes from the contacts. And those contacts are now magnetic. So those are magnets, actually. So you've got these two magnets. And what's known in magnets is that here the red and blue states are not degenerate. In fact, these materials that are used, it's the way I've drawn it, as you can see. One of them is somewhere, say, here. One of them is, say, here. And this offset can be significant. It's like one electron volt. I mean, these are metals where the chemical potential is way above the bottom of the band. That's like three, four volts away. And this distinct, this part is one or two volts. Okay. And the same on this side. Okay. So now the question is, how do you calculate the current through something like this? Now, the distinction comes then in this transfer time that we are trying to calculate. And as I explained, in the interface limited transport, 
The important thing is how long it takes to get through this and how long it takes to get through that. And the point I'm going to make is that in a situation like this, the red ones actually can get in much easier and get out much easier, while the blue ones have a much harder time. Why is that? Because, well, supposing you have a red electron sitting here and it's trying to get out, you know, and we say that, well, that time, we yesterday when we did quantum transport, we put in a gamma, or in general, you know, we're talking about the rate at which it can get out. How do you actually calculate it? Well, usually you'd say use something like Fermi's golden rule. You'd say, okay, this is a matrix element square times the density of states out there. So, if you look here, you'd say, well, the red has a big density of states, blue has just a little. And of course, ideally what you'd have liked is half metallic contacts, you know, ones where only the red can get out and blue has no chance of getting out. That's what you'd really like. But we're not quite there. You know, people have been working on it. It's getting better and better every year in terms of how much dis difference you can get between this and this. Then, right? because if you have a big difference, that means red will get out really well, blues won't get out, and that that's when the spin valve would work the best. I mean, the basic, that's the basic thing. Okay. So, what we have here then is, I could say, a red channel and a blue channel. I have colored chalk, but Joe tells me that those are kind of hard to erase. Right, so, uh, so I'll just, you know, I think with R and B we know what you're, what you're talking about. Okay, so the red one then can get out easily. So I'll call that say T1. And the blue one has a tough time getting out. I'll call that T2. And the thing to remember is T2 is longer than T1 because if you have a tough time getting out, means you have to sit around for a second before you get out. Whereas easy means you just get out in a picosecond. So T1 is short, T2 is long. Okay. okay, so how do I calculate the conductance? Well, basically it's two channels in parallel. So no particular problem. So you could say, well, I have a red channel. So when I try to write conductance, I'd say, this Q squared D over 2, I don't need to worry too much about. That's the constant part here. Because remember, that D has nothing to do with the density of states in the contacts. It's the density of states in the channel. Because here you are really counting states in the channel. This is where the contact comes in because it is contact limited transport. Because what matters is not how fast you get through inside, it's outside. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'd say that for the red channel, then, this would be 1 divided by T1, uh, T1 plus T1, so it's like 2 T1. Why? Because, well, T1 to get in, T1 to get out, total time. Right? Like we, the model we used last yesterday, if you remember, it comes out as the sum of those two things. And then, there is the other channel which is 1 over T2 plus T2. So, okay, so this then comes to 2 T1 T2 over T1 plus T2. That's what it would be. Okay. So this is what's called the parallel combination. Parallel meaning both magnets are in the same direction pointing same direction. Now, yes please. Does it uh, flow backwards? Say this again. Does the uh, spin flow backwards? Spin flow backwards? You know, like any electron. So it basically it's the electron that's flowing. That's all. Uh, why do you ask? Yeah, because uh, yesterday we also considered the, uh, the step from the channel back to the contact line. So now, uh, <laughs> that, do you incorporate that into the time? Right, right. So the model we used that yesterday, where you are feeding in things and how it is going back, after you have done all that, then you have this expression for the T, right? So that's all in the model. So now we don't need to worry about all that anymore. That's it.
Right. If you remember, yeah, yesterday we had this, I was using the inverse of time as the escape rate, the new that I wrote as per second. And there was a new one, new two, over new one plus new two, right? And that's basically what we're doing here also. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. So this is what's called a parallel combination, as I said. So I'll write this as GP. That's a parallel case. Now, the spin valve operation, of course, rests on the fact that the conductance is different when it's parallel and when it's anti-parallel. So you get a different conductance if the magnets are anti-parallel. And this is what has found a you know, widespread use in reading magnetic information. So if you store, if the information is stored in a magnetic disk in the form of the direction of the mag magnetization, and the point is the resistance you measure will depend on so there's a reference one, and if you're in the same direction, you'll have one resistance. If you're turned around, you'll have another. And that allows you to read the information. That's this, okay? that, that's the major importance of this effect from a practical point of view. Okay. Now, if I were to write this, so question is, what do I expect for the parallel anti-parallel combination? Okay, so again, same formula. Mm. Now you see what will happen is these two channels, previously the red one could get, you know, had the same time on both sides. Now of course what happens is on this side it's still a short, the short time, but this time it's the long one here. Why? Because now it's on this side you have turned the magnet around. So now it is like this is the blue side and that's the red side now. So it's the blue that has a much easier time getting out on that side, you see. And so this picture now changes to, instead of T1 here, I actually have T2. And here this is T2, but then that's T1. Those things reversed. And so when I try to write the conductance, you see now you notice both channels conduct equally well. One has a tough time getting in, the other has a tough time getting out. But between them, they conduct equally well. Really. And so, you basically, and the time is just T1 plus T2. But then there's two of them. And so you put a two there. That would be it. Now, if you look at the ratio of the two, so you calculate GP over GAP. What you get is, I think, I think I did this, right? I'm dividing this by this. So that's like multiplying with d1 plus d2 over 2. And so you get that, right? That's it. Okay. And usually the magneto resistance is often defined as this thing minus one. In the sense that if those two are equal, of course, you really don't have anything to talk about, then that will be zero. So you look at how much better it is. So you put a minus one. That amount comes to T1 minus T2 whole squared divided by 4T1 T2. Yeah. Uh, the anti uh, is there a problem of accumulation of the R type and uh, depletion of the B type? Because like it's difficult for R to get out and uh, it's easy for B to get, I mean, uh, get out. Right. So, the, uh, so once you start looking at how the chemical potential varies inside the electrochemical potential, you will see those differences inside. That is true. But uh, that would, I mean, that's all taken into account in your model for how to calculate the current. Okay. So one of the things I'll get into right after this, we'll talk about is how does the, what does the electrochemical potential look like inside? That's okay. it. But the point here is that you'll notice that this magnetoresistance then 
Yeah, it's all it's positive. I mean, this is always bigger than that because as you can see, as long as T1 is different from T2, of course, if they're equal, there's no effect. I mean, this whole thing hinges on that difference, of course. But any difference, then you'll get something. That's it. And of course, ideally what you'd have liked is one of them to be infinite. And then you'd have a, uh, you know, a real, then you'd have essentially infinite magnitude resistance. Okay. That's how it's done. And this is what I guess over the years has kept improving. In the beginning, it's more like 1%, 5%, 10%. Now people talk of 200, 300%. But those ha involve, uh, having an oxide here. The TMR devices which have 300 or 400 percent, actually it's an insulator here that you're going through. But, but the basic idea then is, this is how you, you could visualize it, right? Okay. And one of the important things as far as injecting carriers into semiconductors, by the way, more, the GMR devices, originally the channels were copper. I mean it is usually some metallic channels. But one of the problems people had in trying to do this with semiconductors is that they never used to get much of an effect in a semiconductor. And the reason was something very simple, it's this, that in a semiconductor, usually there is uh, <clears throat> very few modes here. And of course, in the beginning, people were trying to make very good contacts to those things. And one of the things we discussed is when you have a ballistic channel with very good contacts, then the conductance is always, you know, 2Q square, uh, or rather Q square over H times the number of modes in the channel, as long as you have very good contacts. And the point is usually with a semiconductor, what would happen is this and this would look equally good contact wise. Oh sure, you know, you have got a few less, that's okay. But then the semiconductor has only 10 modes. Let's say this one has a hundred and that one has a thousand. Well, big deal. It makes no difference. As long as you're just trying to feed ten modes, hundred and thousand are equally good. Okay. And one of the important realizations about ten years back, which I think led to much significant improvement in terms of injection in semiconductors, was the idea that don't try to make very good contacts. Deliberately make it a, have a barrier in there so that you're actually injecting through a Schottky barrier, so that, so you make it hard for this guy as well as for this guy, but then he can overcome it, he can't, because he has fewer density of states, and then you start seeing, then you have, finally you want interface limited transport. And <clears throat> so the, uh, so the way you can visualize this is almost like in terms of a resistor model, often people draw this, is you have a, Resistance here and a resistance here, and in the, I guess, you have a, I'll call this a small resistance, and a, if it was in the parallel combination, you'd have a small resistance and a small resistance, and here you'd have a big resistance, writing R for big, and you have a big resistance. So, so it could sort of take this Q square D over 2 T1 and kind of associate that with one, a resistance, like an interface resistance. So it's almost like two in resistances in series, essentially. Okay. And so the parallel combination looks like small r, small r, big r, big r, whereas the other combination, the anti-parallel one looks something like this. So reverse that. And that's the resistor model that's, you know, widely used in terms of understand modeling, this kind of thing. And there the way people visualize it is that you want these resistances, the interface resistances to control what you're measuring. And what happens is in a metal, this part is almost a short anyway. But in a semiconductor, this resistance tends to be much, quite comparable. That's how people usually say this. Okay. Yes. So does the contact matter where you are putting the contact? Is it, I mean, if it's a particle contact, and if it's a difference, I mean, first you are injecting the particle and then it needs to transfer horizontally. So does it matter the contact? Yeah, good point. Yeah, this is something I'm not, it's not getting into, but 
Yes, so the question was that often the way this is done is if you had a lateral transport, you might have a contact like this. Question is, is there a difference between this and that? That's your question, right? Is there a difference between this one and that one? Right? And the answer would be if this were really short, then there would be a significant difference, of course. Because what you can show is when an electron is coming in here, if it is really short, then you may not even collect it. It could actually still be going on, right? And so usually these things take a certain length to get collected. And this is what's called this RG length, usually. So you often visualize it as if this part of it is like a bunch of series resistors and resistors that take you upwards. And if this resistance is relatively low, then within a short distance you get sucked up, if not. So these are standard models for contacts, for lateral contacts that people use. And those same ideas could be used here. Because in a way you notice that whatever I'm doing so far, it's not too different from just the standard propagation of carriers of how you think about electron flow. Everything. It's just that you've got two species to take care of. There's an up and a down. In fact, as you'll see, the equations that people use for this Usually, the spin diffusion equation or Valefort equation referred to. It is a lot like there's the up spins diffusing and there's down spins diffusing, and then you can put in spin flip, which takes one type of carrier into another. This is spin diffusion equation that catches these. And so, when you think about contacts and things like that, you know, all the usual understanding of this, you know, where because this thing that I discussed about just mentioned about how it gets sucked up, how what distance it takes, those are standard descriptions of contacts. Nothing special about spin here, okay? Yes, please. One of the negative transistors with this, with the parallel and another parallel case, like correspond to on and off states? That is, I guess, uh, it will depend on the scheme you are using. And usually, of course, your information is more in the form of voltages and charges. But I think one of the things we have been proposing is, you could probably, instead of looking at the charge on the capacitor as your information, look at the magnet itself as the information, for example. And, but those are all open questions now, you know, how you would use it, what might be the best way to do things. Okay. You had a question. Um, just one question. We're just talking about uh, electrons moving with a spin. We're not transferring a spin from electron to electron. Electrons are moving in this. Right. So in that sense, nothing very, so it's like, we figure out the rate at which electrons go, and usually you multiply by Q to figure out the charge. Here you would multiply the sp by spin to figure out the spin current. That's all. And I had some questions often from people, is, you know, what's the spin current? Very mysterious. Well, but the, but I'd say you just replace the Q by whatever spin the, it carries. That's all. It's basically an electron is moving. I mean, nothing more profound involved here. Nothing collective, nothing else. Yes. So, is the spin injection better if you have really bad contacts? If you have? So, if you have worse contacts, like you put in something which is a very good insulator, will your spin injection improve? Like, isn't it? So, right. So, what people have found is that, I, I guess, experimentalists now have kind of figured out the best way insulator thickness they are comfortable with. You know, that's what gives them. The, and it's not like by putting an insulator, the current gets any better. No, current, of course, gets worse, no question. It's just that the one spin gets w far worse than the other. And so you actually have a spin discrimination. Could you actually try like a whole range of different uh, handling values? One is that why can't we just use something which is like those if, it's so straight Yeah, it is just that over yeah, over the last few over the last ten years, I guess, people have tried out different things. And what I've noticed is different groups tend to have different thicknesses they're comfortable with. And you can see what they're using from the contact conductance that they quote. That is, some groups, the papers you'll see is like 10 to the 10th ohms square meter, I think it's the units, right? Or in some cases, you'd even see, like in some groups, you'd see more like 10 to the 7th or 8th. It is like whatever they're comfortable with, they feel, and it varies with material system and so on. I'm not sure if it is all quantitatively very clearly understood. But what is established is, uh, 
bit of a barrier there helps injection significantly. And this was of course a major change in mindset in the, from the beginning because 10 years ago people were almost saying it's impossible to inject into semiconductors. They were almost coming to that conclusion. And of course everybody at that, no one was thinking of putting a barrier because you know you're trying to make a good contact. You try to make an omic contact, right? That's, that's your instinct before you think too much. Anyway, so what you can show is then that, yes, so you have these two resistors and often what people describe as the polarization of a contact, how good it is, in terms of the resistor model, they often write it as P equals R minus R divided by R plus R. That, that would then be a measure of how good your contact is, the polarization wise. Right? And I think you can show that this magneto resistance that I wrote down here, if you just play around with this a little bit, I think you'll get P squared over 1 minus P squared. So in other words, if P is small, you know, and usually most, most contacts you're dealing with 10% or something, then the denominator isn't terribly important then basically the magneto resistance you get is like the square of the polarization. So if you get 10%, 10% would give you 1%. But then when get P gets close to 1, then you have to include the denominator. Okay. Okay, so this is the basic idea of the spin valve. Now, the one question you could ask then is, what does the chemical potential inside look like? electrochemical potential. And as I said, the basic equations people use in thinking about this are just like the diffusion equations that I mentioned before. So, you know, we had I equals, say, something like the conductivity d mu dx, I think. I, I guess I was using Z. I think this was the kind of thing I had written before. Probably to be consistent, I should put a sigma over Q, etc. But now all you do is for up, you put a up there and you'd have a similar equation for the down. But then you also have to, after, so this would be I up, this would be I down. And usually when you solve a diffusion equation, you say that d dz of this is equal to zero. That's what you normally say that d i u d z. I mean, if you had just one species, you, had a, you would have just set that to zero. And that's how you usually solve these equations, right? Now, in this case though, those, that won't be equal because of spin flip scattering. If there is something inside that converts up into down, then you would have to worry about that. On the other hand, if there's no spin flip inside your device, and of course, again, ideally when you're trying to make the spin valves, you try to make your channel so there is no spin flip. I mean, as low as possible. In that case, you know, this is it. This would, but if there is spin flip, then the rate, then what happens is the total current stays the same. So whatever happen, uh, you lose from up, you pick up with the down. So di up plus di, d uh, dz of, should be equal to negative of d i d d z because up plus down should stay the same. Actually. And instead of zero, you'd then have like something that would be the difference it will depend on mu up minus mu down really would be proportional to that and with some constants here. So We'll, I won't bother about exactly what it is, but that would be the, or I guess I should have a minus sign there. So this, at what rate is up getting converted down to down? Well, because they have a different mu, they have slightly different chemical potentials, and so any spin flip processes kind of trying to equalize them. That's how usually people would think about it. Okay. okay. Now, for this discussion for the moment, let's say we are ignoring spin flip processes. So this is all zero. I mean, there is a mu up minus mu down, but it's 
but there's no spin flip current, let's say. So in that case, you know, basically this is it. So whatever I wrote here kind of amounts to saying that spin flip processes give you a some kind of a conductance between the two channels. That's basically what it amounts to if you look at those. Because equations like this you could visualize as sort of a distributed resistor thing. You could map it onto that kind of a picture actually. Anyway. Okay, so let's do the anti-parallel case then. So anti-parallel means small r, big r, big r, small r, and no spin flips here, let's say. So now if I look at the potential, if I look at the up, so this is the up or the red channel, so for that I'd see something like this. So there's a potential that I'll call this zero at this end, one at this end, and I'm trying to draw it for the up. So little drop here, big drop at this end. Why? Because low resistance, big resistance. And when you look at the down, it's reversed. That's the down. So inside there would be a big difference in the chemical potentials of up and down. So it's a lot more of one than the other. Okay. Interestingly, you'll note that if I had drawn the, if I had looked at the parallel one, there wouldn't be such a major difference. Why? Because in the parallel case, it's like small r, small r, big r, big r. So here the potential is about half, here also the potential is about half. Okay? There's a big difference in the currents that are being carried, but potential wise it wouldn't. But let's stick to the anti-parallel. And the other thing is that I'm kind of assuming that the middle is uh, has a very low resistance because it's interface limited. Otherwise, of course, there would be a slope associated in the middle. And a lot of the, when I analyze real devices, you often have to take that into account. And that could be a major thing. Right? But the best case would be when everything's interface limited. Not much is dropping inside. That's what you did. Okay. Now, the next point I want to talk about, that's this non-local signal. And so what I what I drew there, that's like what's down here. So you see that red and the blue. Now, the problem I want to talk about a little bit is, so supposing this channel were extended out in some direction, which is what I've drawn that way. So let's say we consider a structure looking like this. You know, where this channel, this is like I'm looking down from top, this is the conductor overall but I've put my contacts here. These are the contacts. So that's the magnets that we are talking about. And of course current flows right around here, maybe a little bit fringes around there, but that's it. That's where the current flows. But this channel, let's say, extends out that way. And ordinarily, you know, you wouldn't worry too much about it. That's okay, it extends out fine. But what I, was what I want to show is that as far as spin flow is concerned, this could have a major effect if you leave something hanging out there. Right? And this is what I want to explain why. So it goes something like this. In this structure, if you, we just calculated the chemical potentials. So mu up and mu down around here are separated. So it's like the mu up somewhere here, mu down is somewhere here. Now question is, how? what does it look like if I look out here? Then what will happen, you see these things are not in equilibrium, they have two different chemical potentials, they will want to kind of go out there, so if I plot the mu, and now I'm sort of 
plotting the mu with that as an axis. So the up is somewhere up here, down is somewhere here. And as you go out in this direction, they will kind of try to approach each other because they will try to come back in equilibrium and to try to get to somewhere in the middle out here. If you, if you go more than a, what you call a spin coherence length, or the spin flip length, whatever length it takes for spins to come together, if you looked out there, you will gradually find it going down over there, someplace. So you see something curious here though, that you see, remember, I'm, what I'm plotting is, this is the mu, this is, this axis is x, and this axis was z. I mean, we know what it looks like in this direction. Now what I'm trying to figure out is what it looks like in that direction, okay. two, two dimensional. And the point is, here they're well separated, eventually they'll come together. Now if you look at the current, again, no new principles or anything, nothing strange about spin or anything. We just know that when chemical potentials die out like this, it drives up spins this way. But then, you know, this side, of course, there can be no net current. There's no net current upwards, of course. But if you look at the down, you see it's coming back. So if you actually just use the diffusion equations I've written down, again, no rocket science, whatever we had before, you just looked at that and you calculated the currents, you'd find that there was a lots of upspins going out, lots of downspins coming back. That's it. And of course, if you calculate the total current, it would be zero as you expect, nowhere to get out, no currents should be flowing that way, no question. But point is there's a spin current though. Why? Because you see, when we calculate total currents, we take the up current, you know, the rate at which Electrons are flowing in the up direction and you multiply it by Q and then you have a, the down and you multiply it by Q, same Q. And so total charge current is like the sum of the two things. But when it comes to spin, you see one carries positive spin, the other carries negative spin, you know, this red, red and blue. So whatever units you use for spin, the point is you'll put a plus one there and a minus one there. And so when you look at the total spin current, it's like the difference between the two. I up minus I down. And that there is a significant amount of it right there because you've got ups going out, spin downs coming back. So there's a lot of spin current going this way. So when you look at the spin currents, you'll find, yeah, a lot of it, you're losing it. And whether you have this thing hanging out or not can make a big difference to how well this thing is working, really, for example. Is it possible to have a device with zero charge current and a lot of spin current? Uh, here, at this interface, you definitely have that, right? If you look at what's going out, there is no charge current, but there is a significant spin current. That's definitely true. Now, overall, whether you could engineer it so that there's no charge current anywhere, that I'm not sure. Uh, because of course, eventually everything is driven by charge voltages. We don't quite have a spin battery, I mean, from outside, right? So finally, you usually put a charge voltage. But if there's a clever way of doing that, yeah, that would make it. Yeah, that's true, because for a lot of these spin devices, what you need is a spin current, and it would be good if you could get it straight without a lot of other I squared R losses. power consumption in the application? In this part of it, right. Of course, one thing I mentioned is that, yeah, when you calculate a VI, you would probably, yeah, the way I am thinking here though is because we are using the elastic resistor model, there is no dissipation as such, if you think of it that way. On the other hand, if you are thinking of it as a diffusion equation in the way normally people think, and you say that uh, resistance is associated with V times I, then I think you'd say, sure, uh, there's a V up times I up plus V down times I down, right? So this would be, and that would be what you'd call then the dissipation out there. And you can always take something like this and write it this way, V up plus V down over two times V up minus V down. 
I'm sorry, I up minus I down plus I up plus I down over 2 times V up minus V down. Think this is just an algebraic thing. You can always take something like this and write it this way. And uh, sorry, I should have written plus both and minus both. <coughs> sorry. And then you can say it's like the charge voltage times charge current and spin voltage times spin current. You could say that. And then you could say, well, here you have a spin voltage and you have a spin current. So that's the, that should give you a dissipation based on that. But if you are using the elastic resistor model, then as I've said, dissipation is finally all in contacts. So that's a separate issue, yeah. I was going to ask that uh, with the transport of electrons, why would that affect? Why would the spin uh, uh, wave or spin propagation up affect the transport of electrons? How it would, how it would affect that? Right, right. No, no. So in this model, then what would happen is, because you have the spin current going away, you effectively put a G here because it is taking up currents and turning it into down currents essentially. So as you try to cross this region, you are losing some ups and you become down. So in that model, that's all, yeah. So the total power dissipation, yeah, if we've got some kind of battery carrying between those two magnets, right? The whole that's something here, right? Yeah. Outside. So where does this additional spinning dissipation? Oh, I, yeah, this is if you looked inside somewhere here. So if you're looking from here, then all you have is a charge voltage, and then you have a charge current. So if I apply this view out here, then one way to do it is just charge voltage times charge current plus spin voltage times spin current, but then there's no spin voltage here. But there's lots of spin current, of course. Internally, if you do some place, then probably you got... You're saying some of that power internally is dissipated. In the spin part of it, probably. Right. I, think I haven't thought about all this carefully, but I think that's what I would say. So what units do we use for spin current? Are they also... Yeah, this is where people do it differently. I prefer to do it amperes because then you can compare, etc. Lots of times it's defined as you multiply it by h bar over 2. What I mean is the idea being that spin is so, this angular momentum and it's half h bar. So the equivalent of q here would be half h bar. But in that case, your spin current wouldn't have amperes as your dimensions. It would be more like, you know, h is joule second per second. So the unit of spin current then would be just energy. So you would say you have a spin current of so many electron volts, you say, and then you don't quite know how to compare. It's fine. Or I prefer to just keep it as how many per second. Yeah. So if it's a real, is it a real current? I mean, why are we not breaking KC epsilon and then where I is going upward? No, I would say, yeah, it's like, yeah, basically it's electrons that are flowing. And then the question is what, how are they, what charge they carry and what spin they carry. And it's just that some have positive spin, some have negative spin. And to some extent, it's a lot like the heat current we discussed also. If you remember, with heat current, there was a mu, and anybody with energy above it carried E minus mu. Anybody below it carried negative. So it is a little bit like that. When you calculate heat currents, you find that some of them contribute positively, some of them contribute negatively. And it it's almost like the two spins <laughs> in that sense, right? What's above and what's below it. Little guys. Okay. Okay. Yes, please. How do you, uh, this spin current, uh, when you are trying to measure the spin current, and is there any way to say and uh, distinguish between spin up and spin down, or you just have a value? Okay, let me come to that. Usually what, yeah, so what the next topic I'll get into is this measurement issue. And there, yeah, usually you're measuring charge things. So, yeah, so let's, I'll talk about that in a minute. Let me come to that. Okay. Okay, so this is the picture I think I had up there. 
which shows how this thing varies. Now the next point I wanted to make, point uh, raises what he said is that can you measure this thing? Because this is something that has actually been known for quite some time. I mean, lab, I think the first experiments may have been like late 80s, right? Mark Johnson, say, a, a famous paper in those days, I think, showed this, this that you can measure a non-local voltage. Non-local meaning it's a voltage that is outside your current path. This idea that your current is flowing one place, but you could measure a voltage by putting down a probe somewhere here. And the point is, question is what do you measure? Now instinctively, and I'll try to do this a little better in a minute, instinctively the way you think is what a probe measures is again this electrochemical potential because it tries to, it's a high impedance thing, doesn't allow any current to flow, so it basically goes to whatever electrochemical potential it connects to. So when they are equal, that's, that's the voltage you'll have. So if you had put in just an ordinary contact, what it would have measured is the average of the two. And I, as I said, I'll make this more quantitative in a minute. But if you put a red contact, red meaning the one that only sees ups, let's say you had a perfect red contact. What I mean by that is it doesn't even care about the blues. Then what it will do is it will measure this potential. Now, if you put a blue contact, then of course it would measure that potential because it would come to equilibrium with the blue things. And I'll make this quantitative in a minute. You'll see. Whenever you put a contact, won't there be a charge current in that direction? No, but the contact is a voltage probe. What that means is when you measure it, you put a high impedance voltmeter, the way you measure voltage, right? That would be it. And if you put a non-magnetic thing, in other words, which looks at both red and blue, then it will look at the average, okay? So people actually, you know, put in contacts there and they can flip it and they see indeed the voltage changes and how much it changes, that is a very good measure of how much of a spin voltage you have. So one way to measure spin voltage is measure the voltage with a red contact, measure it with a blue contact and then look at the difference, whatever it is, okay? Now to make this quantitative, the way you can think is this that I've got a mu up and I've got a mu down and I'm putting here a contact which sort of connects to it through say some conductance, I'll call it G up and connects to some conductance G down and of course this is a voltage probe so I have a high impedance voltmeter, doesn't let any current flow. So finally it will float to some mu, which I'll call the mu probe. It will go to some mu such that there is no net current. Basically. And so the idea is whatever flows here and whatever flows here, they should cancel out. And that will tell you what the probe will measure. See? And of course if these two G's were the same, it would have just measured the average that you can see. But you can make this quantitative by saying that, well, let's write it this way, mu up minus mu probe. Yes, I'm wondering if the P may be confusing because I've used P for parallel and all. Yeah, well, I'll just drop the subscript. So by mu, I mean whatever that floats to. So this times G up you know, because this is like voltage times conductance, that's current. And then I can write the current in this arm, mu down minus mu times G down and say that that must be equal to zero. Then I put a probe down. So what potential will the probe float to? Well, it's a weighted average. It's like G up over G up plus G down times mu up plus g down over mu up plus mu down and then mu down. So you basically take a weighted average of the two and the weighting is determined by how well you couple to it which is what is reflected in those conductances. So if you are doing actually modeling it with any GF or things like that, those would be reflected in the gammas you would put in. Or here we are just talking conductances. 
just thinking in terms of conductor. Thank you. That's it. So it's this weighted thing, weighted average. Yeah. You, you expect G to be different for up and down depending on. Is it a red magnet or a blue magnet? And if it's a just a normal non magnetic thing, those are equal. And then you measure the average. So this is what you'd expect from common. Just co common sense, you'd have expected this should be half. But what this shows is that, of course, real magnets are never quite, you know, Ideally, you would like say G down to be say, 0. That would be a perfect red magnet. Then of course, you would have just measured that. And if it is a perfect blue magnet, you would have just measured that. In practice, you do not quite have that. So what you measure is like the spin voltage times the polarization of your magnet. So in that sense, if you measure 1 microvolt, the actual spin voltage inside could be 10 microvolts because your polarization could be 10 percent because you are losing a little, losing the signal there somewhat. Okay? That is the important thing. Okay. So, what is the real role of the channel in this case? Like, looks like everything is being done by contact itself. Okay. Because in this thing, the channel has no particular magnetic properties at all, right? It is just, just an inert background in that sense. And everything, it just provides the highway, that is all. And everything is about how you feed it and look at it. It is really all about that. <clears throat> okay. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, this is the, so this is this non-local signal that people have measured actually for a long time. Non-local because as I said, current path is here, you can measure, but you measure the voltage out there. And often people measure it with one probe around here and another one very far away so that it basically goes to the average anyway. Okay. Now, so far then, everything I've said, it makes it sound like, well, nothing very profound involved. It's like, you know, there's an up and a down. That's about it. And you have to keep track of reds and blues. But there's a little more to it. And that is what is the part that is kind of mysterious and different about spin that takes, gets, getting used to. Yes, please. So, I'm just wondering, uh, how does the um, um, non-local signal compare to uh, you know, the normal case when you don't have uh, any mechanism? So, when you put the, uh, the same uh, probe there, the same position, uh, will the uh, non-local signal always be smaller than the uh, case for the dynamic? Right. Without any magnets, there would never be any spin voltage though. What I mean by that is... You're right, but uh, the probe, you also, you, you also know the client. Right, but what I mean by that is, if you had no magnets, if you didn't have any spin voltage in the first place, then no matter what you put here, I mean, red magnet, blue magnet, they would all measure the same thing. No, I'm probably not getting the question. Yeah, so I'm just comparing it to without, you know, by any, uh, magnet. without any magnets for the source and drain. Right, and also for the probe. You, you're just right. Just normal, <laughs> normal voltages. Yeah. So this voltage will always be uh, bigger than. Yeah. The bigger part, I'm not sure because, I mean, absolute magnitude may not be. But that's why when you look at spin voltage, it is not enough to just measure one thing. It's important to look at a difference, right? So, for a for example, look at this difference or take a red and a blue and to look at the difference. Because as you know, voltages can exist outside a current path anyway. I mean, in the, you know, this Van der Poel measurements, you put a current here, measure a voltage somewhere out there. So, when you measure a spin voltage, you always have two insulin sources, right? That's why I'm thinking that you tend to be Right, spin voltages do tend to be small. So roughly speaking, you see what happens is the voltage you get is like P square. What I mean by that is the source and drain that created your signal, let's say have a polarization of P, then the spin voltage inside tends to be about a factor of P down. And then when you try to measure it, you lose another factor of P. So basically, that's what, and that's why typically, you know, we get say 10 microvolt for more like millivolts 
of input. Yeah. You had a question. So the spin decoders like depends on Right. So this is very different for different channels. So semiconductors, they say that the great advantage is the long spin coherence lengths. Right. In silicon, you know, Ian Applebaum in his experiments, he claims, you know, tens of microns is what he has shown in many experiments, actually. On the other hand, in copper, I think it would be more like a tenth of a micron or less, 0.1 micron or less in copper. But metals, of course, has the other advantages that I mentioned, that injection is better demonstrated here. Yeah. So, naively, I would have thought that if there is no magnetic scattering mechanism, then the spin will not decohere. But uh, that would be true both for silicon and copper. So, what, why is there a difference? Yeah, this part, of, yeah, I think that a lot of the spin decoherence usually is finally about spin orbit couplings, residual spin orbit coupling. But in copper, probably it is bigger just because there are some magnetic impurities. Probably in semiconductors, you can get it cleaner. That's my impression. But in copper, you tend to have residual magnetic. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you, you up and down, I mean, they don't change linearly. So, uh, you know, if you have so does it mean that we have the spin, uh, like the spin changes that just as any? Right. So it's like if you looked at up plus down, it is zero everywhere. Uh, but individually, up keeps going down. Uh, I mean, uh, up keep, is getting reduced as you go away in the x direction, and down is also reduced. Both of them. Right? And one is just the negative of the other. So if you looked right at the lower end, close to the channel, you might find, say, one milliamp of upspin going out, one milliamp coming back. You go far away, you might find one microamp going out, one microamp coming back. But overall, just cancel. No current of, no net current, of course. And the spin current is going down. Right? Why is silicon? Why is there so much focus on silicon for silicon? No, I'd say actually in the beginning, a lot of the focus was more on the three fives, actually. I think more of the early experiments. Well, the silicon experiments, as far as spin chronics goes, is more recent. And of course, the metals, copper and all, that's what it kind of started the whole thing of GMR. All of that was in copper. Now, the relative advantages, there are many issues one can talk about, so I'm, which are, may not be completely clear, actually, which ones would be best. Because... We are talking about, is there like a trend where you say, for smaller artifacts, they say carbon, something like wrapping would have even better uh, spin, I mean, lesser spin. Yeah, remains, yeah, I guess remains to be demonstrated. So these are things people are right now arguing about, which would be the best material and so on. And the issues are, one is this coherence length, how far can spins go? And the other is injection efficiency, that is, how big can P be? That is, how, that you want to inject reds preferentially to blues, how well can you do that? And that's at different levels in different materials. How do you explain spin orbit coupling? How does, please talk about How, okay. Maybe I'll get into it a little bit, but then we can talk about it. Yes, please. It's a weird question like that. I was thinking like uh, if you don't have any voltage source, say so you have a uh, magnet up and magnet down, so can you still see the spin current if you are not applying any voltage? Well, then there is no current, right? In this, in this, in the usual situation, there is nothing. But then there could be. Hmm, there is this equilibrium spin currents under certain conditions that people talk about, but which are somewhat restricted, and you have to. Yeah, be careful about, there of course shouldn't be any dissipation as you know, I mean, if there's no voltages applied. But yeah, I don't have a simple one line answer. I'm not that yes or no, really. Hmm? So since there's so many questions, people should write these down in the discussion. That's true. We can, yeah, yes, yes. Please do write it down and yeah, we can continue the discussions actually, yeah, at 3.30 today. Yeah. Oh, let me mention one thing here and that is that when you put down a probe, like this. I said that the way it works is it makes the net current equal to zero and that's how you figure out what mu, 
what pro voltage it should flow to. But you will notice that the spin current is not zero, the charge current is zero. So there is actually a, as far as this magnet is concerned, this contact is concerned, there is a spin current. Because, you know, up spins are going out, down spins are going out, uh, going this way, and there is a spin current, and this magnet has to actually then turn those spins around and provide the torque to, you know, get rid of all this. And this is where, of course, if it's a big magnet, it does that effortlessly, nothing much happens. But one of the very important developments in the last 5, 10 years is the spin torque. And that is what people found is that if this is a small magnet, small magnet meaning something that's like, you know, a few nanometers thick, like a couple of nanometers. So not a very thick magnet, something relatively thin. Then with enough spin current, the magnet itself can flip. You see, so it's like the magnet is sitting this way and you're continually injecting spins this way. And of course, the magnet is having to take them all and turn them around. But of course, it, it feels a torque as a result. And if it's a small enough thing with big spin currents, it will give up. It will say, okay, no, <laughs> it's much better to be this way, essentially. <laughs> and that's a, exact, and this is something that again can have a major effect and actually is having a major effect, I'd say. Because in the, before I said that the magnet stores the information and from GMR you measure, you use it to read that information. But with this effect, you can write the information. In the sense, Previously, it was like when you want to write it, you bring in magnetic fields, big magnetic fields, and that's how you write it. But when it comes to small magnets, it is much better, it's much more efficient to be writing it with spin currents. Because when you put magnetic fields, they are kind of like all over the place. So if you have another magnet here, it is very hard to turn this one without turning that one, when you're, especially when you're trying to get things small. Spin currents can be very directed. So I say, you know, it's almost like this difference between a microwave oven and a conventional oven. It's like when you have a big thing to heat up, microwaves are not very good. But if you have just a cup of coffee to heat up, this is perfect. You hit it right where it is. You see? And so my belief is as you go to small magnets, in general you'll see more and more of situations where you turn magnets using spins, really. So that's the spin torque that I won't really be talking much more about, but it's a very important thing in this field. Okay. okay. Now, in the remaining time, what I wanted to get across is that spin is a little more than this. What I mean by that is it's not just red and blue. Because if it's just red and blue, then as I said, no new principles really. You just have to keep track of two species. That's all. And then you know, calculate things carefully, that's all. But the part that it, and this is okay as long as all your magnets are in the same direction. But you could easily imagine things where you see, I inject spins this way, but then when I measure it, I use a magnet that's not parallel or anti-parallel, but somewhere in between. What will I get? You see? Now that requires getting in this thing much deeper. You know, you have to think, you have to understand spin better than that, better than what I have just described. In other words, supposing the same measurement, I kind of discussed how you measure the red, what the red magnet would measure and what the blue magnet would measure. But what if you had a magnet that was sitting somewhere in between? It is not quite red, not quite blue. You see? What would it be? And this is where I say, <coughs> that, so what we have seen so far, is if you look at the voltage signal, what you measure in the probe, then one case is the parallel, parallel meaning that the magnet you are using is in the same direction as the majority spin you have injected. So you have lots of red spins and you are measuring with a red magnet. And if you measure with a blue magnet, you will get a lower chemical, you will get a lower voltage reading. So if you have a red measuring majority red spins, you'll get bigger signal. And a, so this is the red magnet measuring things. This is the blue magnet measuring things, and you get something here. And the question is, so this axis I could label as theta, and anti-parallel means like 180 degrees. And what we have seen is 
that here you have a maximum, here you have a minimum. And the thing is, in between, it goes smoothly, basically. So if you are somewhere here, 90 degrees, you'd measure half. Now question is, yeah, the, when you think about it, the nearest analogy I know of is to the polarization of light. But spin for electrons is like polarization of light. But there is this very important difference. The thing you learned somewhere in first year physics is that if you had a polarizer, so photons are polarized in this direction, and you have an analyzer, and they're parallel, you get lots of light getting through, and you can block it by putting it at 90 degrees. Okay, that's it. And you can describe the signal you'll get, what I've written there for photons, that's cosine squared theta. So if the angle is theta, it's cosine squared theta. Electrons also is similar, but it's not cosine squared theta, it's cosine squared half theta. That's the thing. And that is related to this half integer spin, etc. But the point is you realize that you, you cannot quite think of it as a vector, because with vectors you'd have, you know, orthogonal would have orthogonal would have meant 90 degrees. It's sometimes people say it's like the square root of a vector. But the thing is, there is this whole algebra of spinners that you have to get used to, to kind of see, follow the literature on those lines, you know, where you're working this out. But the bottom line is though, that it is cosine square theta over two. And this is a basic difference. See, as I said, if it were really like vectors, then two perpendicular magnets should have given you a minimum. But the point is it's the, it has to be 180 degrees to give you a minimum the anti-parallel thing, you see? And so when you are trying to understand this then, how do you include this in your models? Now, again, if you are using NEGF, it's actually, as I mentioned before, the great advantage is how little you have to understand. And as I said, as far as you are trying to calculate this with NEGF, the calculations are fairly straightforward in the sense you don't, don't need any new for equations now. Whatever I showed you yesterday is all those same equations. It's just that those matrices are now twice as big. That's about it. So what that means is, if you had say the, let's say you had a device with four points in it, those four black dots. Then your matrices, the Hamiltonian matrix, the self energy matrix, everything you write down. Those things are, would be four by four. Well, when you include spin, it'll be eight by eight because every point will now have a up component and a down component. So the up component and a down component, that's the red and the blue. So instead of having matrices that are n by n's, your matrices would be 2n by 2n, right? And any GF wise, as I said, if you <coughs> just do that and you know, <coughs> know what you're doing, you know, you should be able to calculate things, etc. But as I think Mark said, I think the quote he put up was where that, it's nice to know that, you know, NEGF understands spin, but of course we'd like to understand it too. So, <laughs> so, uh, so when you look in there, in, in the, it's just that when we are thinking about it, of course, it is convenient, always when you think of the spin, we think of it as a vector pointing in some direction, see? And it takes some time, and I guess, uh, in these lectures I won't be able to go into it, but I have other lectures on NanoHub where we talk about the spin. Uh, the, how you deal with spinners and things like that. But here the main point I wanted to make is, I think yesterday also when I was talking about the NEGF, I had mentioned that, <coughs> uh, as you know, the wave function has these two components. But in NEGF, what you look at is psi psi dagger, that is, Dagger means this conjugate transpose, and as I mentioned that it's like this thing multiplied by that. <clears throat> so this is like up and down. So when you up and down, star and down star. So when you take it together, it's like up, up star, down, down star, and then you have up, down star, and then down, up star. So, Gn, if you just had two points, would look something like this. And you know, one of the questions that had come up then was, like, what's these off-diagonal terms? Do I really need them? And, of course, what is here tells you the number of upspins. What's here tells you the number of downspins. 
And these things kind of have information about the other components. This is the right way to think about it is the GN, it's like what I've written on top, the top corner is the number of upspins, which you could view as the total number of electrons plus the Z component. Let me explain what I mean by that. <clears throat> that, you know, you have, let's say you have N up and N down, then the total number of electrons is the sum of the two. And the Z component of the spin is like N up minus N down. So when you add the two, it's N. When you, and so, if you have a matrix where this is n up and this is n down, then of course this one is like n plus s and this one is like n minus s, you know, with a divided by 2. Other than that. So in that sense, when you look at the top component, you could say, well, that's like the total number of electrons plus this sc. And the other one, you could think of it as the difference or you could say, well, that's the up, that's the down. But it's the off-diagonal components that tell you about the X component of the spin and the Y component, what you have in the other directions, you see. That's the information in there. And do I really need that information? Well, for example, if when trying to measure it, I put a probe in the, you know, as long as I have a red magnet and a blue magnet measuring things, I really need only the diagonal information. But if I want to figure out how, what will be measured by the middle one, then actually I'll need the off-diagonal information to do anything. And broadly this is true not just of spin, because spin is a nice example because it's just two by two. You know, this whole thing in general about quantum transport, what is the use of all those off-diagonal terms, is just that with different types of probes you could actually be measuring things that depend on those off-diagonal things actually, you see. And lots of times it doesn't make a difference because of all the phase breaking and uh, that we discussed earlier, but interference effects, all of that is often in those off-diagonal things. So, in the spin case, you see immediately the meaning of that. Now, the way NEGF works is that, you know, previously I, when I said what, uh, what do you, ca what, chemical potential that does the probe measure and we found that there was something here like G up times mu up and then there was G down times mu down. And when you use and divided by G up plus G down. And what will happen in a quantum transport model usually is these things would become matrices. And instead of this, you would have something like trace of gamma g n, something like this, instead of, instead of this, which of course if these are diagonal would amount to that. But if these are not diagonal, then it would have all this information in it. But this is where of course the way the quantum transport models work then, the information is in matrices of that type. You see, we have got a two by two matrix. On the other hand, when I'm visualizing it, I usually prefer to think of it almost as just set of four numbers. What I mean by that is at any point, you know, I'm used to thinking of electron density ordinarily. In the case of spin transport, I'd say at any point what I'd like to know is what is the electron density, what is the spin density in the z direction, x and y. So basically I need to know four things. I need to know the electron density and I need to know what direction the spin points and how, how much it is, you see, that's it. And if you had like normal devices, you know, up and down are all equal amounts and all that, in that case these would all be zero, there is no spin density at all. Normal devices is just only electron density. And then how much of this you have depends on how polarized, what's the polarization of your contacts, what you've been able to inject and things like that. And then what you measure is I said, it is like taking a trace of these two things, but in terms of this vector, the way you can think is, you see, 
the you know I said that for photons it's cosine square theta for electrons is cosine square half theta but the cosine square half theta you could write as half of 1 plus cosine theta and so you could you could think of it as half of 1 plus the angle between what you are measuring say the p the polarizer or whatever you are trying to measure and the dot product with the analyzer so you could write it that way and then you see when these two are anti parallel it's 1 minus 1 0 and these are parallel it's right and so the way i think of it is yes i've got this and then what i measure depends on of course there's a charge voltage and then there's a spin voltage which depends on the dot product of the spin part and the spin part to analyze that's a, that's what that's how you can think about it but as i said as far as any gf is concerned this is how it works and you don't really need this as long as you are doing collinear spintronics when everything is in one direction just call that z and you are done of course for homework problems we could call that x and see that whether you get the same answer because you could have called that any direction but you know in terms of thinking just call that z and you are and you are about done but you need all this whenever it's non collinear spintronics where multiple directions are involved and how how can multiple directions be involved well if you had a magnet that was neither parallel or anti parallel to this but in some other direction or if you had some internal things like a magnetic field which actually to rotate your spins as it go along so you injected it this way but by the time it got there it's in some other direction okay? that's this hanley effect that people have observed in many devices that with a magnetic field you can rotate the spin or this rashba based on this rashba field that's the spin orbit coupling that is what is now established in these high spin orbit materials like indium arsenide and so on if you put an electric field in this direction and an electron is moving in this direction it effectively sees a magnetic field in this direction and this is a relativistic effect i mean it's the the spin orbit interaction basically is a relativistic correction to the schrodinger equation and it's usually relativity doesn't play much of a role in most things but this is where people say well because these nuclear fields are enormous actually there is there is a relativistic effect and this has been known for a long time in all materials and the bigger the atom the larger it is so usually in silicon it's relatively small compared to gallium arsenide and carbon it's supposed to be even smaller but uh, indium arsenide is a material where you know with a gate field people have found there is a relatively uh, you know, uh, sizable effect and which people have measured uh, the effects of this on transport. And what it does is effectively have a magnetic field this way. So what that means is you inject a spin like this, but because of the spin orbit coupling, by the time it comes here, it could be in that direction. And then what you measure, of course, will depend on the angle between this and that. See? And that, of course, you wouldn't get out of a simple up-down diffusion model. You'd need something else. So it's important to be clear on where you need the, this part and where you don't, right? Okay, let me stop here and continue.